So now we'll move into this section uh, three four, which deals with three dimensional force systems. All right, let's take a look at this problem. It says determine the tension developed in the cables A to B, A to C, A to D required for equilibrium of the 75 kilogram cylinder. So here's our cylinder and it has a mass of 75 kilograms and we have these cables A to B. Well, here's the link at A. So A to B and then A to C and then A to D. And it looks like they have a coordinate system, the X, the Y, and the Z coordinate system such that the, the link at A is at the origin, isn't it hot? Does it look like A is at the origin? Okay, and then we look like we can get the locations of points B, C, and D, and they're used to support this cable. Now, this book doesn't make a big deal of always putting in G like this. Some books, you know, it's like G is in every figure pointing downward, but that's the, that, that, that's the assumed direction of G, even though it's not explicit in this illustration. So, uh, if you wanted to, you could come in here and get a free point diagram of what? What makes sense for this problem? What, what would be the free point diagram that would make sense for this problem? For A. For A, yeah. So we come in here and I try to draw it like this. Now I draw it in 2D as a circle, but in 3D it's a sphere encompassing that ring at A. And so it cuts this rope, which is pulling down, and so there's a tension force acting on the interior, the ring at A, pulling down. That's called the weight, and that'll be the M times G. So 9.81 times 75, and that would be in Newtons. And then we're going to have tension force pulling up like this, going toward B, and uh, tension force going up like this toward C, and a tension force going toward D. Now, all three of these are cables. Can a cable be in compression? No. They would be in tension. Or at worst, it would have nothing in it, no force, no tension force in it. Uh, that ten all these tension forces are shown in the direction where it would be a positive magnitude for the answer that we're looking for. Um, we could... <clears throat> we could look for something like the tension in the cable going A to B, as well as the tension in the cable going A to C. Or you could even shorten this and just say B is equal to whatever answer you're going to get in Newtons, and then C is the answer in Newtons. What do you mean by, well, I avoid the subscripts, and I have something that really distinguishes it. So B and C and D would be the force, the magnitude of the force in each of those cables, which end at the location B and C and D. So your choice on notation, but we do need to be consistent with it. So um, let's form, for, uh, here I've shown you the tension in the cable going from A to B. I'm just going to call it for working it out here B, the unknown B the magnitude of the unknown B. Likewise, this will be C, because it'll be a little cleaner with my uh, working it out. Okay? Because I want to try and fit it all onto the screen. If I go to another screen, students are like, put it back, I can't see what you're doing. Okay, so what is going to be the uh, approach? Well, the, the approach is you have a free particle diagram and you have equations of equilibrium, so the sum of the forces X, Y, and Z. And now you see why it's real important to be able to represent forces in 3D. And that was the main thrust of the previous chapter, wasn't it not? So, uh, so here we go. You said to yourself, if I wanted to represent that force as a vector going from cable A to B, wouldn't it be the magnitude of the tension force B? times some unit vector from A to B. Does that notation make sense? And so this is uh, the magnitude of the tension. And then what we're going to have is we're going to have R 
A to B a displacement divided by R A to B, which is the magnitude of the displacement. That's how, that's how we get a unit vector. Right? We, we get the direction and then we normalize it, and that gives us a unit vector. Okay, so this is going to be B, and we've done this maybe a couple times. <clears throat> So maybe I can go a little faster, maybe not. If in doubt, go slow and put what are the location, what is the location of point B in the X, Y, Z coordinates? I have to get that right. If I mess that up, the rest of the problem is just not going to work. So isn't it going to be uh, negative, negative 2 meter in the X or negative 1? Negative 1. Very good. Negative 1 meter in the X. What is it going to be in the Y? Positive 1.5 in the Y. And in the Z? Positive 3. So this vector right here is going to be um, uh, a negative. I'm going to draw it like this. Uh, negative 1 in the I plus 1.5 in the J plus 3 in the K, and I'm going to divide it by something. What am I going to divide it by? Magnitude. That magnitude. How about if I pause, let you catch up, I'm going to walk around, and when I come by, you show me what the magnitude of that vector is that you're going to divide by. So a lot of people were able to calculate the magnitude of 3.5. And then some people uh, looked at this and they said A to B is equal to B times. And then they didn't like this 3.5, so they multiplied the whole thing. Uh, they, they did both numerator and denominator. Negative 2i plus 3j plus 6k. And then they divided by 7. So you got rid of the 3.5. Okay, so then we're going to do the force vector from A to C, which will be the magnitude of the tension. And then we're going to have another vector here. So how about a couple people work that out? I'll walk around and check a few on the force now for C, from A to C. Uh, it goes uh, negative 1 in the I, negative uh, 2, that's shown back here in the J, negative 2J, and then up to in the K. And when we calculate the magnitude, 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 2 squared, that's 9. We take the square root of that, and it's 3. Look good. Very good. And then the last one, F. A to D will be the magnitude of the tension times, and then what is it going to be in the X? 3i. What will be in the Y? Negative 4j. 0 in the K, and we divide by 5. Um, go slow. If you make an error, it's just going to haunt you. And going to cripple your ability to get the right answer. You just won't be able to do it. So now we say uh, the sum of the forces in the x must equal to zero. That gives us an equation, doesn't it? And so we pick off the component. Let's take a look at uh, this one. You'll put negative 2 sevenths times b. That's for this force a to b, that, that component in the x. And then you'll pick off negative one-third of the magnitude C, the force going from A to C. And then you'll have plus three-fifths D. And there is no component. Maybe I should have written this one. This is going to be zero I plus zero J minus uh, MG in the K. So it's going to be plus zero or equal to zero. So... Do you see how that is, the equilibrium equation, some of the forces in X equal to zero? How it links in the magnitude of B, C, and D, the tension forces in each of those cables? Let's do this. I want you to write the sum of the forces in the Y equal to zero, 
and the sum of the forces in the z equal to zero, and then give me those other two equations. I've given you the first equation. How about you get the other two equations? I'll walk around and check a few. Um, for the y, we'll have positive 3 sevenths b, and then we'll have negative 2 thirds c, and then we'll have negative 4 fifths d, and they sum to equal zero in the y direction. Okay, and now in the z, the only thing a lot of people are forgetting is this term over here, this weight has uh, in the k, and so they're just leaving out the mg that when I walked around and looked at a lot of students. But let's go ahead and write it out. So what do we have? We have a 6 sevenths in the b. Okay. 2 thirds times c plus 0 times d. And you can put negative mg equal to 0. That's fine. But we're going to set it up in a matrix ax equal b. And so what I'm going to do is modify it and put that negative, uh, flip it over to the other side, so now it's a positive mg. Our matrix of problem, A, X equal to B. The matrix A, the unknown vector X, and the right-hand side, vector B. And so for this problem, our A matrix is a 3 by 3. And it has magnet, uh, coefficients negative 2 sevenths, uh, negative 1 third, and 3 fifths. And then it has 3 sevenths, negative 2 thirds, negative 4 fifths. And then it has coefficient 6 sevenths, 2 thirds, 0. And then uh, the unknown uh, vector uh, of, of our, what our answer needs to be. We want to solve for B, C, and D. And the right-hand side, the standard not notation is AX equal B. And so B is our right-hand side. That's 0, 0. And then 75 times G. Uh, I'm just going to leave it as MG. Okay. Now, at this point, I know a few of you already put it on your calculators and solved. True? And were you able to get the answers that I have up here? Yes. You were. So what I want is everybody, everybody in this room. Guess what? This is just like an exam. Right? I would say a very high probability in next exam, you're going to have to solve AX equal B 3 by 3. You could try it by hand, but if the calculator that you can bring into the exam and is approved for the exam and you can use on your exam can be used as a tool, why not use it? There's no shame in using your calculator, is it? Okay, sometimes all I need is one major theme per lecture. This would be the major theme per lecture is do not, do not for the rest of the semester have a calculator not know how to solve a three by three on your calculator. In exam. If, your, if your calculator is too low power, invest in another one. The Casio, the latest Casio that was added, I think some students bought it, is very sophisticated. It'll handle a 4x4, four four, which I don't think the TI-36 will. At least that's what the students have told me. And that new Casio is one of the cheaper ones, too. It's like $17 or $18. I put the prices on the calculators that I found retail in the syllabus. And none of them were over $20 or $21. All right. So you solve this. You need to be able to solve it. If you can do it by hand, congratulations. But I, I, I would say by hand is going to be very error prone. All right. There was one thing that I forgot to mention on this problem. Okay. So uh, how many significant digits did I purposefully put out here for that answer for the first part, for the magnitude of the tension in, in, in cable A to B. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Did I talk about significant digits before? Right? Uh, let's say you're on the exam. Your calculator spit it out, the seven significant digits. Should you report the final answer to seven significant digits? 
Yes or no? No. Read the end of chapter 1, okay? Uh, maybe that was our snow day or ice day, right? And, and uh, people said, no, I don't want to hear anything in chapter 1. That's all a review. Let's get on the good material. Well, let's do this. What drives the answer? Well, we had the mass of 75 kilograms. Okay, that's two significant digits, but let's assume it's even three significant digits. If your mass is only no good to three significant digits, what should you put your final answer in? Maximum three. So you, at this point, let me just tell you, you could turn your brain off and just put final answers to three significant digits and you'll do fine with me. But if you turn your brain off and put six or five or more you know, like that, you will lose points on exams. I think I mentioned that, but now I'm going to stress it because I started grading the exams. Okay? So now somebody says, well, that 75 is uh, 75.0000. You know, it's good to eight digits. Okay, great. How about G? Somebody remember G? How many people remember G is 9.81 meter per second squared? How many can remember it to more digits than that? All right. But where does that value come from? Well, it came in the book. You know, my professor told me. Uh, okay, but what does that value represent? Over the surface of the earth, at sea level, it's an average value. Okay, let's say I go to some place where I'm higher than sea level. Maybe I'm up in the mountains. Is G 9.81? No. How about if I go toward a mountain range where there's a pull because of huge mountain mass and I'm down in the valley but I've got a big mountain mass. In the Himalayas it pulls. It pulls G. G is shifted. All right. So I uh, spent probably too many hours of my life one time checking into this. So the standard value of G is like 9.80665 blah blah. Nobody remembers that, but they round it off to 9.81, three significant digits. And, uh, but if you tried to compensate for the latitude, longitude, and elevation right here, that's the number you'll get. That's the best I could get. Now, how close is that to 9.81? Does it agree to sig three significant digits? Not really. It's 9.80, right? So basically, if you just change the input of G to this number and rerun, you go from 830 with all these, 829 with all these digits. You're saying, well, this is a trivial thing. Okay, turn off your brain. Just don't ever report a final answer to more than three significant digits. But in your intermediate calculations, you must keep them. Otherwise, you will have accumulation of round off error. All right. So just compare these, compare these. Doesn't it make sense to report the magnitude of B to maybe 830? I would take 829. And then for the C would be 35.5, 35.6. Both would be acceptable. And then for the magnitude of D, 415 or even 416. Again, think about it, study it, know why you do it, or choose the plug and chug. I'm just going to give them, hey, Montoyful wants three. I don't know why. But he gets all torqued off if you give him more than that. Okay, it, 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 so the other one is I always ask students, okay, how old are you? And they say, I'm uh, 21 years old. No, that's only good to how many digits? You gave me an answer to six digits on the exam. I want your age to six digits. You know who you're going to be calling to find out what time of day you were born? Your mother. <laughs> your mother's going to know that. Hey, your son, you were born. Your daughter, you were born at this time, you know. Yep. Okay, but try that sometime. Say, okay, I need to know my age to six, seven significant digits. You'll be challenged. All right, now that I got on that one, let's go back and solve this problem. So you, everybody has a handout on this one. It's a rig. You have two struts and one cable. What's the difference between the strut and the cable? The cable can only be in tension, but the strut could be in compression or tension. The strut you can push as well as pull. That's a big difference. That's a big change now for us. So it supports a 200 kilogram crate. So out here is the crate. It's connected at A. 
You can see the color code on the struts a little hard, but it comes up from point C up to A and then from point B up to A. And then this cable from A back to point D. Just looking at it, if somebody cuts the cable, just comes in with big scissors or whatever, cuts, what's going to happen to the system? It's not going to be in equilibrium. Which way is it going to fall? It's going to tip, fall down toward the y-axis, true? Okay. Uh, if somebody, you know, breaks these struts, which way is it going to fall? Yeah, so you can kind of tell, use a little bit of intuition, the cable can only be in tension, the struts can be tension or compression, but which one are they going to be in? They're going to be in compression. They're going to be in compression. True? The struts are going to be in compression. Right. So, if you come in here and you want to solve for the compressive force in each of the struts and the tension force in the only cable, what you might want to do is, is you might want to draw a free particle diagram of point A and then come in there, and it's really tricky in 3D. That's why one of the reasons I give you a handout is that you have this one is the tension force coming down. This would be the tension going to uh, in the A to D. And then you have this compression pushing up, that compression pushing up uh, for the other struts. For the strut, this would be the, the, the compression in B to A, and this would be the compression uh, C to A. And then you have the weight of the crate coming down. So we think a little bit, we get the direction, our orientation of those forces acting at point A. And now we do this, we say, okay, I need to get that uh, force for the cable, let's say A to D. I'm going to talk about the tension in the member A to D times a unit vector, am I not? And that unit vector is going to be something in the X, something in the Y, something in the Z. I'll divide by IJ, the magnitude, so it'll be... Something I, something J, something K. I'll divide by the magnitude. Can you get the unit vector for A to D? What would it be in the X? Should I pause and let you work on it? Or in the interest of time, just kind of give it to you? Just give it to us, huh? Okay, so it's going to be zero. But what about in the Y? Well, it's going to run 4, isn't going to run negative 9.6. That's from this point A back to point D. And then what about in the K? Isn't that going to run a negative 4? Down? Yeah. And so what does that one, the magnitude of that look like? The magnitude, 9.6 squared plus 4 squared square root. Is that a 10.4? Yeah? All right. And now this is the force vector. These are all little unit vectors, I, J, K. What is the force for the strut going... Um, um, I'm, I'm going to call it uh, C to A. So that'll be my compression in member uh, uh, C to A times a unit vector force. And it's going from C to A. That's the right direction. It'll be a change of how much in the I? Two in the I. How about in the Y? Come out positive four in the J. And then it'll go up four in the K. Can't make an error here. Does that look good? And then what's the magnitude of that vector? So we normalize it. And is in it 36? Oh, I'm sorry, square root of 36 then is 6. Right. All right. And then the force vector going not from C to A, but B to A, will be the compression in the member B to A times from B to A is negative 2 in the I plus 4 in the J plus 4 in the K divide by 6. 
And let's go ahead and put our weight of our crate. Last time I really didn't emphasize that well, but it's our mass of our crate times G, and it's zero in the I, zero in the J, negative one in the K. For equilibrium, we have one vector equation. The sum of all three of those forces acting at that point A is equal to zero. That one vector equation gives us three scalar equations. We write it as if the x direction, y direction, z direction. So again, one vector equation or three scalar, they're equivalent. And the way we set it up is we're going to set it up as a three by three in a matrix. So we're going to have the, uh, um, the, the zero times the tension A to D. I just put that as a placeholder. Nine, negative 9.6 over 10.4 times the tension A to, whoops, that's in the X. Zero times the tension A to D. We'll have uh, plus 2.6 times the compression C to A. And then minus uh, 2, 6 times the compression B to A must be equal to 0. All right. How about in the y direction? Not negative 9.6 divided by 10.4 tension A to D. Then we have 4, 6 uh, compression C to A. And then uh, 4, 6 compression B to A equal to 0. And then in the z We'll have negative 4 over 10.4 times tension A to D. And then we'll have plus 4 over 6 compression uh, C to A. And then, what, what did I write right there? Isn't that a bad looking 4? I don't know. Hopefully you weren't struggling too much with that nasty looking 4, but let's write it out. Plus... 4, 6, compression, uh, B to A. And then we have minus MG. Minus MG is equal to 0, but uh, we want to flip that to the other side. And when we flip it to the other side, this just becomes equal to MG. And then we have our matrix problem again, AX equal to B, where our matrix times our, our um, solution vector, which is the the three components, tension, A to uh, D, and, um, then uh, compression C to A and the compression B to A. Those I'm going to write it like this, is equal to the right-hand side, 0, 0, mg of the crate. Okay, and then these components, 0, 2, 6, minus 2, 6, and then negative 9.6 over 10.4. Uh, 4, 6, 4, 6, and then negative 4 over 10.4, 4, 6, and 4, 6. That's my 3 by 3. I didn't draw that so nicely. Come down like that. I'm going to pause. Does that look okay? Isn't it just like what we did the previous problem? You can try this one by hand if you like but I strongly recommend you use your calculator. How about everybody, before you come to the lecture next time, you make sure you know how to solve a three by three on your calculator, okay? And then do it enough times before the next test that you'll remember it on test day, okay? I'll try and remind you for the next test, but if I fail to, let me try and emphasize it now. Be ready, be ready, be ready. I'm not guaranteeing a problem like that, but I'm saying it's a high probability. Thank you very much for your attention.